Hi, I'm Chrissy Ballantyne. I'm one of the co-chairs at the Cardiometabolic Health Congress that's being held in Boston. And um, uh, my colleagues from this morning session on lipids are here. And why don't we introduce ourselves, Erin? Uh, so I'm Erin Mikos. I'm a cardiologist at Johns Hopkins University who focuses on preventive cardiology and women's health. Yeah, hi, I'm Mike Baja. I'm also at Johns Hopkins in our Chicaroni Center for the Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease. I do uh, atherosclerosis imaging and cardiometabolic disease and, and risk assessment. And I'm Pam Taub. I'm a cardiologist and professor of medicine at UC San Diego, and my practice focuses on cardiometabolic disease. So we get the East Coast, West Coast here, uh, and it's a really, I think it's a, a comprehensive overview that we did this morning. We start off with one of the key things that we do in prevention, and the first thing is, what's the risk of the patient in front of us? And uh, Mike, you want to talk about yeah. how, how are we doing that in, you know, in, in terms of combining our traditional approaches but with some of the newer approaches? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree. It all starts with risk assessment first, right? We want to make sure that we're treating the patients that are at the highest risk more aggressively. And also finding patients who are lower risk than we thought and maybe being more flexible uh, with their treatment goals. So I talked about the strategies that we use for that in clinical practice. Of course, we start with the traditional risk scores, like the pooled cohort equations, right? Get a sense of what someone's risk is, but very commonly that's going to leave us wanting. Uh, those patients might be intermediate risk, and we don't know how high risk they truly are. So then we'll move to thinking like things like risk-enhancing factors, right? Things like a LP little a and metabolic syndrome and many other things can enhance someone's risk or a family history. But then we also talked about going deeper, too. Can we use biomarkers or genetics? But I focused on imaging today. And I talked about how we can use atherosclerosis imaging tests, for particularly cardiac CT. That's what the guidelines support right now. For example, a coronary calcium score, a simple test that can be done in the outpatient setting, very quickly, low cost, to get a sense of someone's burden of atherosclerosis and make our treatment decisions accordingly. So I talked a lot about, about the calcium scoring. And I think uh, Dr. Mikos, Dr. Taub, you guys both use calcium scoring sometimes too in your practice, right? Right. So, you know, in addition to identifying um, uh, people who might be at risk, and you know, in primary prevention, uh, it also can identify people at lower risk. But we also use it for secondary uh, uh, treating patients. Once their calcium score is above 300 and certainly above 1,000, I actually treat them like a secondary prevention right. patient and target for these lower LDL levels, less than 70 or even less than 55 for those with extremely high calcium scores, uh, using some of the tools that we use in secondary prevention patients. Right. Well, what I love is the 2022 expert consensus statement that Dr. Ballantyne was an author on actually incorporates using cal high calcium scores to determine what medications patients should be on. And in that consensus statement, for people with calcium scores over 1,000, PCSK9 inhibitors are actually recommended. And this is great because this is going to help our patients that have subclinical atherosclerosis that are very high risk get access to these important therapies. So Pam, you know, there's a lot of focus sometimes on the absolute score. So Mike and I, people talk about 100 over 1,000 being extremely high, over 100 being high, and maybe considering aspirin. But what about, you know, particularly in terms of women and also younger men, but the age and sex percentile. So this is something, if you have a woman who's 50 and her score is well under 100, but her percentile is high, I, I, what do you deal with that? So maybe her score is 40 and she's 48, but that percentile is going to be about what, Mike? Uh, yeah, if it's a woman, that doesn't put her probably in the 90th percentile. Yeah. So, so what, how do you how do you deal with the, this this issue? You know? I look at both, and whatever is higher, if the percentile is higher, that's what I use to to guide my decision making. I mean, I definitely because as you point out, I mean, we, uh, especially for women, the actual score can be misleading, and you do want to look at the percentile. Right. Because I don't want to just prevent events in the next five years or ten years. I think the absolute score is, is you know, might be a little bit better for short-term risk, but I want to present you know, events over their next decades. And so, you know, a, a woman who's above the 75th percentile, even if her absolute calcium score is, is, is relatively low, you know, she's at a very high lifetime risk. And so I actually also treat that similar to a secondary prevention patient where I'm really targeting for LDLs less than 70 with more intensive LDL lowering because I want to prevent her long-term lifetime risk. Yeah, yeah, Mike, you mentioned that a low absolute score, but in a younger individual, you still have to consider a lifetime risk, and that's the right. percentile may be beneficial. Yeah. The, the other one that comes up is 
And, and we see that sometimes a young person with a bad family history may want to get a calcium score. Uh, I give the kind of caution that, well, you're, you're on the young side, it may be a zero. We, we're not going to under-treat or not necessarily stop treat. But this, the, their concept is warranty periods. Uh, and what do we do when we're dealing with younger individuals? When do you rescan them? Right. Uh, uh, in terms of that. Yeah, you had a couple of really interesting points here that I wanted to point. One, one quick plug for a, a document that will be coming from the American Society of Preventive Cardiology soon that tries to define advanced subclinical atherosclerosis, and it's going to think about uh, absolute scores, but also percentiles, like above the 90th percentile would be someone with advanced subclinical atherosclerosis that might have lifetime risk implications. Uh, you hit on that, and then you hit on this important question of, uh, of the way, let's say, a calcium score is used differently in a young patient and a middle-aged patient or an older patient. In the young patient, you're looking for unheralded risk to treat more aggressively. In the middle-aged patient, you're looking to risk stratify them either way. And in an older patient, you're looking to see, is there a reason to treat less aggressively? Do I have a, a rationale in this patient that might be multimorbid to de-emphasize uh, aggressive preventive pharmacotherapy because I need to emphasize on something else? So we really need to be thinking about whom we're testing and, and how to interpret it. But like you said, once you get a, a calcium score, for example, let's say, that at zero, doesn't mean you're done. You didn't, you didn't tell the patient, well, you're free of atherosclerosis for life. Usually we'd recommend uh, someone whose score is zero, who's intermediate risk, repeat that in three to five years. Again, if it might change your management, you can track them over time and see if they start developing atherosclerosis. So there is a, a warranty period that we can discuss. So I get referred patients, they've had statin intolerance, they've tried multiple statins, maybe an older woman, pretty good risk profile, and then it comes back zero. What what, you know, Aaron and Pam, what are you all doing in terms of the, this concept of sometimes de-risking or maybe changing the focus of the patient? How are you using it when you get a calcium score? Do you, are you getting them sometimes in older patients and then if it comes back with a low score, what do you tell them? Well, it's all about shared decision making, what the patient wants. So a zero calcium score in someone who's older age does put them into a lower risk category. I mean, uh, there's certainly, if they're on a statin, I mean, I'm happy to continue it. There's something about, you know, keep your arteries clean. But if it's the patient has a strong desire to de-risk, if they're on multiple medications, you know, I, it does place them into a lower risk category. So certainly, um, you know, I may not um, push to initiate a statin um, if someone has a calcium score of zero, if they don't desire to start a statin, uh, you know. So I, I find it really helpful in the patients who, um, have some statin reluctance or statin intolerance. And so maybe these aren't the patients that you need to keep pushing to try to get on a statin because it does reclassify them to a lower risk. Pam, you're kind of from the, uh, San Diego. San Diego has been kind of one of the centers in terms of talking about statin problems in terms of some of the data comes out. So you probably see a lot of this. So how do you handle this in terms of they come in, they're reluctant, you get a zero calcium. Where do you, do, do, you, do you refocus them on prevention or what do you do with those people? Well, of course you wanna emphasize lifestyle and, and non-pharmacologic therapies, but the other thing with the calcium score, I, I, what I tell patients, it's one angle by which I take the picture. I take 30 different angles to really get a comprehensive assessment of your health. So I'm also gonna look at what is their lipoprotein A? What is their glycemic control? Do they have metabolic syndrome? Do they have type two diabetes? Because we know that the benefits of, cal uh, of statins are pleiotropic. It goes beyond just LDL lowering. So I'm gonna take all those facets into my clinical decision making. And yes, if they have a calcium score of zero and all their other risk factors are under really great control, then I would feel comfortable saying, okay, well, you're someone that doesn't have to be on a statin, but if they have a calcium of score of zero, but there's a lot of other metabolic parameters that are very elevated, that's a, that's a different discussion. So, and, I, and I will use the trade-off sometimes, say, look, if you want, if, if you'll really continue to work hard on your diet, your lifestyle, your exercise, but I'm worried about your blood pressure because that's a different type of an issue and those are small arteries, your risk for stroke. So I think sometimes that's what I'm, you can refocus them. Maybe we don't have to go with a statin, but you know, your blood pressure mm. is not where it should be. So I think it's a useful test, but as you point out, you gotta look at the whole picture, sure. all the risks of that patient. And, now, and, and in fact, that kind of takes us to a, our second topic that Aaron, you covered is, you know, so we've got somebody and they've had an event and maybe we put them on a statin, but there's still this concept of residual risk and looking at the whole picture. So how do we do that? Right. 
So we know that although statins form the basis of both our primary and secondary prevention as first-line agents, that events still occur in statin-treated individuals. We call that residual risk. And so how to reduce this residual risk, I think this is, needs a tailored approach. One size doesn't fit all. So for some individuals, it's because they have residual burden of, of LDL uh, lipoprotein particles and need further LDL lowering. And we heard a wonderful talk this morning by Dr. Taub, who walked us through all of the new landscape for LDL lowering, taking us back to the Jetson era, where we had the statins and zetamide, to the Renaissance era of uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors and enclizerin, and let us look into the Jetson era of the things coming down the, the, in the future with uh, gene editing. Uh, so we can certainly think about LDL lowering. There's individuals whose residual risk is related to lipoprotein A elevation, and we have uh, novel therapeutics that are right now in um, phase three trials, seeing whether lowering lipoprotein A can also reduce cardiovascular outcomes. Some patients remain at residual risk because they have elevated a burden of uh, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. Some patients, they have residual thrombotic uh, risk, and we'd be thinking about either dual antiplatelet therapy or uh, low-dose uh, rivaroxaban uh, for the, uh, you know, like the COMPASS trial criteria. Um, and uh, other patients have residual risk from residual inflammation. And there's a lot of work in this area and trials ongoing um, studying uh, specific anti-inflammatory uh, targets that can um, lower um, IL-6 and lower CRP and whether those can reduce major adverse cardiovascular events. So I think in each patient, of course, there's also residual um, risk related to diabetes and cardiometabolic risk and weight. And so we have, of course, our SGL2 inhibitors and our GLP-1 receptor agonists to help reduce this cardiometabolic risk. And there's risks related to kidney disease. And we have targets there with you know, our SGL2 inhibitors and our um, uh, novel uh, uh, MRAs, uh, uh, non-steroidal MRAs for patients with uh, kidney disease and, 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 and type 2 diabetes. So there's a lot of potential things we can do. And this is why it needs an individual approach, whether we take data from their clinical history, from biomarkers, from imaging, and try to figure out you know, what's, their, what's driving the residual risk and which targeted pathway should we you know, go down on to help try to reduce the risk so, of future events. You know, and I think it's, so it's fantastic that we have so many options, but it's also, I think, one of the reasons why this, I really like this conference is you get a lot of information on all of those options because when you're seeing the patient, it's exactly like you said, trying to individualize to make the best choice for that patient. And so, you know, Pam, let me start up. So we get the patient post in mind. They frequently do have, you can talk to case, a lot of these things going on in terms of one something that it doesn't happen enough in terms of some foundational, let's talk about cardiac rehab for a second. I know you kind of like cardiac rehab, I think. <laughs> but, you know, in terms of what that, because that doesn't happen as often as it should, but so in terms of, let's go kind of foundation, what are you doing with your cardiac rehab in terms of lifestyle, diet, and exercise? We'll touch on that first, and then we'll talk about how you implement the other options. So we do intensive cardiac rehabilitation at UC San Diego, and that's what we offer everyone. So that's 72 hours that we get with the patient, which is pretty amazing. And a big component of that is exercise, but we also have a big component that's focused on lifestyle modification, including teaching people how to cook for themselves and use healthy ingredients. And we actually have a teaching kitchen, so we're able to demonstrate to our patients how to cook for themselves. We also have a, a instruction on uh, stress management, and we teach them different modalities like yoga, because it's really not just about exercise. It's about every, every aspect of your lifestyle that you can improve on. And our patients have loved the program. We've looked at outcomes. We've looked at changes in biomarkers. And the patients that have gone through our program have had significant decreases in their LDL, in their blood pressure. Their uh, exercise capacity usually doubles by the end of the program, so all really important parameters. So with everyone, we, can, we, we sometimes forget about lifestyle. And lifestyle is synergistic with pharmacology. I mean, that it, it, it's so beautiful when people are doing the right lifestyle t techniques and then you can lower medications. So foundational therapy, lifestyle, and if we were to take a look at all the positive benefits of exercise, you know, if you could put that in a pill, everybody would be fighting over it, uh, uh, with it. But now we go to the new therapies, and you know, we've talked about 
the residual risk. Talk about a little bit of pain. You talked about some of the newer options, uh, you know, with statins and enzymes, older ones, but how, where do the newer options fit in? And then maybe a little glimpse towards where are we going? No, I think we're in just an incredibly exciting era in cardiometabolic disease, and especially in lipid management. And in my talk, I talked about the renaissance that we've had, especially with the data from PCSK9 inhibition. So we really have so many tools for potent LDL lowering. And really, in terms of secondary prevention, our patients should not be having other events. After, if, if we do our job right and they're compliant with the medications, if we utilize some of these agents from the PCSK9 inhibitors, bempedoic acid and glycerin, uh, the antihypertensives, the diabetic medications, the renally protective agents, if we're using all of them correctly, there is just so much residual risk that, that we're able to reduce. And especially with lipid lowering agents, uh, the important aspect of it is combination strategy. Uh, Christy, you've made this reference to how in hypertension, we are very comfortable using combination therapy to get to the levels we want to achieve. We need to start getting really comfortable with using multiple lipid lowering agents to get to those goals. Yeah, so uh, you know, I think we, if you think about it, we start off with risk assessment, and that really begins with a comprehensive look at all the risk. Right. Even in that very high risk patient, you had an event, you may have addressed something, you know, you talked about the residual risk. And then there's the issue of how do we combine all of these options? Uh, so it's, I think it's a, it's, we're at a very exciting era, as you said. I mean, when I sit in clinic now and I, I look at the people coming in and, uh, you know, their LDLs are 25, uh, it's it just, I mean, these were unimaginable when I got started uh, uh, for it. And the treatments that we've got for hypertension, diabetes, obesity. I mean, it's, you know, it's really extraordinary with it. It is a challenge, uh, and, there, and I think, you know, Erin, uh, you've always talked a lot about this patient-physician discussion about how do we choose these therapies, how can we implement them, what do they want to do, and then also the issue of cost and affordability and, you know, trying to work with them so that they can get the therapies. Uh, so it's not always simple. It does take some time, but it is extraordinary what we can do to help our patients right now. So I want to thank you for joining us here. I hope that you will all attend next year's conference. It's going to be back here again in uh, Boston, October 11th to the 14th. Don't miss it. It's going to be a great event. Thank you.